forward very well, that we had this protagonist who had access to the Prothean Cipher, which made us unique, right. could give us an excuse to be the one to have to go down with the away team, um, and that the game would be us trying to learn about the Reapers, basically. Or that would be realizing that we can't beat them. You know, it took the whole fleet just to beat one, so we're not going to beat them all. And so we need to right. learn about them and try to see if we can find some weakness or something. And I think that would have been a better a better setup going forward than their whole kill it, Shepard, bring him back to life, have him work for Cerberus thing. It would have been in the meantime, but the quest for knowledge is a stalling tactic. It's, it's not the journey, it's the destination. So you're on a quest for knowledge, you have this special means that means that only you are the one that can get it. But what's the knowledge? It's like, again, if the knowledge is the Reapers all have a big off button on their underside and you can just, like, push it, <laughs> and that's how you beat them? Or if the, if the special knowledge is about their motives and it's like, you still have to come up with a reason, it's like, well, why are they wiping out everyone? It's scary that they're doing it, but if you're if you're trying to come up with a reason to where you can either use that knowledge it's like what do you come up with and apparently they're apparently they never came up with a sufficiently compelling reason for that to either stick with it or they just eventually ended up at you know they're they're the robot human police yeah what i would want to know I mean, we know, I would love to be kind of like a go back in time, be on a fly on the wall when they made the decision to reset so much at the beginning of the second game. Right. To, to do this whole, you know, kill Shepard, bring him back, he's working for Cerberus now thing. That's such a big change to happen super right. fast. And I, to this day, I don't quite know why they did that. I'm trying, I try to... Well, yeah, that's always that's always the dilemma. Is we can know what they did, but we can yeah. um, without them just coming out and saying it, which is not likely to happen. We just won't really know why. Well, now we can death use of the we author. We story. we don't even have to accept their explanation, right? It, it, well, you know what? We can. Here's the thing about death of the author. We can kind of shunt out what the author themselves says about it. Or we can uh, presume that we can read our own meaning into what we're being shown. But what we can't do is to make of ourselves a blank slate and make of art a blank slate in which, you know, every single work of art is sui generis. We evaluate art by our understanding of what we're meant to take from the things that we see in it. It's like, you know, this is, this is the classic thing about structuralism. It's like, there's a visual language in, in film. You know, there's, there's a way we can tell that when a sentence is being written, it's, it's leading up to be something. It's supposed to be suspenseful. We know that something is being written this way because it's leading to something. We know this because we've seen it done before. We can't, create a world in which there's no intent behind what we're seeing because everything that we've experienced of art tells us that art is created in a way that is supposed to lend us meaning by the very nature of the way that it is made. When a shot is framed in a certain way, we know that someone is about to step out from the right side of the screen and join the conversation. It's like there's language and meaning written into every single part of it and you can't detach that from uh, either intent or just the idea that we're supposed to take meaning from that. So, yeah, you can say, you know, if you don't like whatever meaning they're attributing to it, we can come up with something else. But it, you can't interpret art in a way that it's just stochastic noise that, that happens to have occurred. So you're, you're not a postmodernist? Well, uh, well, I'm not a... Well, I mean, structuralism is is just true. I mean, that's just how ideas are. It's like, uh, again, it's like when you have, like we know what a knock-knock joke is. It's like when I say knock-knock, you know to say who's there. 
It's like, you don't sit and wait for me to continue. It's like, why is he saying knock, knock? It's like, we, it's just part of human communication. It's like, you can't not uh, impose your expectations of this medium onto what we're meant to take from it. We have to discern intent behind it. And you know, uh, Bob, you mentioned a moment ago about how Seamus referred to the Mass Effect writer. And hmm. Seamus was always very particular about this, is when he says that, he's not saying that there was one guy sitting at a desk typing all this out, and he was thinking about all this. This is exactly what he was talking about. He was writing, he was writing about, about art as an intentional endeavor, or at least something that we cannot experience as anything else. That the way that we experience it, we have to think of it as though there was someone that was sitting at a desk you know, putting meaning into it that we are intended to take from it in the way that we're accustomed to taking it. Mm. It's like when someone says to you, Paul, it's like when you're when your kid walks up to you and says, I'm thirsty. It's like you assume that this means what the sounds I'm thirsty has typically meant from your child and not that he has invented an entirely new form of communication in which this means something incredibly different and profound. Yeah, yeah. It, but it, but it also like, is because we've set that up beforehand, right? Like the child and I have agreed upon a, a mode of communication that's in English and that's on a certain volume level, right? If it comes up and yells, I'm thirsty at me, I'm going to respond differently. It's all it's but, all arranged beforehand. But what I'm saying is that if you think of art as a form of communication, and I do, mm. then death of the author and like this kind of writing intent completely out of it and making it completely like just something for your own uh not gratification but just like your own thing to interpret completely unmoored from any kind of expectation that it would be interpreted a given way sure it's like you never treat any other form of communication like that ever from anyone and if you tried to do that like if you tried to do that to your wife and it's like like when we know that that there is such a thing as subtext it's like when when you ask someone if they're fine when you ask someone they're how they are and they say they're fine depending on how they say it we may take it that it means it's fine we we may note that they said it in a really uh snappy way that maybe they mean the opposite of what they just said in a literal sense but it's like you don't think about the things that someone says to you typically you don't think about the things that someone says to you as if the person saying them had no theory of mind whatsoever and, mm -hmm. and as, as if it's just like the the words that they said were just like stochastic noise that originated from no kind of impulse at all right and it's just like you have to take for granted that there's there's like some cogs turning back there and i think so that's I, what seamus was trying to do with with his games analysis right he was he was looking at right. games as if there was an intent behind them as if there was a, a really uh forceful vision that was driving it forward driving it somewhere right and especially with and a game like mass effect where it was billed as all your choices are going to matter. This is all building up to this, you know, unified game. Uh, it's all going to be tied together at the end. It's like, well, if they're saying that, then we can't just throw that out and decide, oh, it was all, you know, off the cuff or whatever. So it's either a it's lie like, or it's uh, it was badly executed. And everyone seems to have kind of hopefully and charitably interpreted it as being badly executed. Right. And of course, you can say that, you know, art, art is diversely interpretable. But all communication is diversely interpretable. But again, if someone says to you, if you ask someone how they are and they say, I'm fine, that's diversely in interpretable. And that's two words. That mm. could mean a thousand different things. But you do not then go on to say that what you think they mean when they say, I'm fine, is the answer. And that what, and that, you know, you can never really know what they meant by saying it. So you may as well disregard the idea that it was meant to say anything. It, it exists solely for your perusal. And it's like, no, there's there's something behind it. And you say, oh, yeah. well, you ask them, especially when it's, they especially when it's a big group of people that are all working together 
and things don't always go according to plan and there's a lot of you know miscommunication and maybe they change things along the way it's like mm -hmm. then you start blurring the line of okay so maybe there isn't really a clear intent uh behind it there you can't really boil it down into you know one person that has this very particular message that they mean to say one very specific thing we know that's not how projects work but again that's also how someone uh, you know, sitting across from you, you know, telling you about their day is, it's like, you know, I'm doing it right now. I'm, I'm making a fool of myself just badly. Like, <laughs> well, and, but and it's, the, it, it's you take like your two examples. The the yeah, there's, there's no one in here. It's like, you can take whatever you want from the words I'm saying right now, because there's, there's nothing meant by it. It's, it's, it's all just, you know, random noise. It's like clouds passing by. Well, but, to take your two examples, the saying I'm fine doesn't have an action associated with it. Like, it's not really an embodied phrase, whereas I'm thirsty is really embodied, right? It's like, I want something to hold something to drink in, and I want to have something to drink in that thing, and I want to be able to drink it. So, But Paul, what if I'm fine actually means I'm desperate for human affection, and I want you to hold me? Right, but it could mean a lot of things, right? It could mean... Please don't right. touch me. So, so it doesn't have a definite embodied thing in it. And that's what's so interesting about games is that games are a definite embodied answer to a question. The game itself is you can do these things and interact in these ways, right? It's this. It's almost like I'm thirsty, right? The game itself is that thing. and But the idea of developing a game is much more like I'm fine, right? It can mean so many different things and there's so many different games that you could make out of the idea of a game. And uh, I, I just think it's fascinating that the the entire question of meaning has to be has to be boiled down into a definite thing in order to make a game. And the Mass Effect series is this beautiful example of the difficulty in taking some sort of abstracted idea and embodying it in a way that's satisfying, especially for a large group of people. It right. might just not be able to be done. Which kind of brings us to another topic, uh, the the whole cyberpunk game, Cyberpunk 2077, where, again, it was this idea of cyberpunk and being able to do stuff in an interactive simulated world. And, like, what does that actually mean? Well, it, in the instance, it means... It is kind of a disappointing, poorly polished game. But, like, was that what they said they were going to make? Well, it's hard to say. It, it certainly didn't make very many people happy. Uh, well, I can't speak to Cyberpunk because I didn't play it. <gasps> but, so I'll take your word about it. Okay. But you gasped that I haven't played it when you just said people <laughs> tended to not really like it. Well. <laughs> It's like, I, I, I'm taking your strategy, Paul, on, on Cyberpunk. I'm letting other people play it for me. There you go. It's a bold uh, but uh, useful strategy. No, I, I, I took my own Cyberpunk abuse recently. I played Stray, you know. Mm. It's just, you can get past that in a few hours and, and get the exact same feeling of that was a thing that I played as you get out of Cyberpunk 2077. You just don't have to pay 70 bucks for it. Uh, Cyberpunk isn't seventy bucks. That's not true. Well, well not that, that's the price point they want now. But I mean, not cyber right. industry in general. Hmm. You know, I, I will say though that the the idea of like, oh well, games are so hard, we we have to move to seventy dollars has had about the worst proving. Yeah. Uh, at least on, you know, I was going to say at least on PC, but I'm thinking of games recently that have come out that have charged seventy dollars and i'm thinking of things like well now i'm gonna have to check steam i think wo long was seventy dollars no i think that would be sixty dollars but i well, think uh <laughs> wild hearts was one that came out recently i think that one was 70 bucks i think uh forespoken was i thought that was a yeah and and people really didn't like forespoken Wild yeah. Hearts came out, and I don't think people like that. And moreover, these games weren't just, like, not particularly well-received. I think they were, like, very broken. Like, uh, maybe not Forspoken, but I know Wild Hearts and Redfall. Like, oh, Redfall, Redfall was another big one. Like, that's a, that's a mess. Uh, 
Yeah, I, again, that's one that, like, I didn't even hear about that game until it had already come out and flopped. <laughs> yeah, I had nerve. I was... I was disappointed because I read somewhere that they were going to make another Dishonored or something, and then they decided to make Redfall instead. I saw... Um, I think with a lot of the recent games, it's it's been... I think examples of they're releasing them before they're done. I mean, this is the case right. with Cyberpunk 2, but um, definitely with Redfall, from what I've seen, it's just like this game needed at least another year. Like, um, they have vampires that attack you and they're unable to pathfind around a chair. So right. if you stand on you the other what? side of the chair from them, they'll just swipe futilely at you forever. Maybe, maybe this is actually genius. <laughs> That's James, a $70 price point. And, and they're all horribly broken, especially on PC, and just, like, not functional and full of bugs at launch. So in a few months, they're going to say, clearly, $70 is not enough to put out a working AAA game. And we need, need to go higher. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, like, like, look, the proof is there. We keep releasing games that cost $70, and they just, like, keep not being developed right. <laughs> the solution must be more money. Well, it's almost, it's, for me, it's frustrating on almost like an economic level or something that all these big budget games come out broken, AAA games come out subpar, and in the meantime, you, you compared Cyberpunk to Stray. I mean, the indie games, I mean, I personally am more interested in the indie scene now than I am the AAA scene, which I just kind of keep an eye on. Um... It seems like there's this big anchor around the neck of the industry. I, if I could just snap my fingers and make some of these companies fail, I think I might, in hopes that they would reconstitute themselves in some better form. Or just make one of them fail really terribly to serve an example to the others. Oh, yeah, that could work too. Uh, it's like, all right, lay it on the table. Who would it be? Well, I think right now... I think Activision is my least favorite. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, uh, you, you know what? It's a nice... They've surpassed EA in terms of horribleness, huh? Uh, yeah. Well, it's it's kind of it. Like I said, it's a hard choice, but they've been more in the news lately, and I've never, I've always, can't keep my temper whenever I see Bobby Kotick or hear him speak or anything. It has been quite a quite a crazy trip with the with the acquisition and stuff. Is that still going through or they're still working on it, I guess? Well, I thought it had stopped, but then I think even just today I saw something that said maybe it'll still happen. Hmm. Oh, uh, so there. So has has Microsoft not officially bought Bethesda or Zenimax yet, or how's that working? I thought that was a done deal. Or was this like? Uh, hmm. I believe they made the offer. The offer was accepted. And now they're trying to get regulatory approval in all the countries where they do business to perform the merger right. without oh, breaking yeah. uh, monopoly laws or something. So I just I just Googled it because I was curious myself. And I can tell you this breaking news. As of 40 minutes ago, New York Times says the EU has approved it. And I think that was the big obstacle was EU. Uh, all the big regulatory bodies were just like looking around nervously wondering whether they should and then they saw a Redfall release and they're like oh this will be great for antitrust this will yeah. will combine these two and within a year or two their value will have shrunk considerably <laughs> taking a big slice of that concentrated market power out it's like uh, really if 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 what's their, what what's their next big game uh Starfield yeah. No, that's somebody else. Or, or I think is it is Starfield. Thing? Yeah, it, I mean, if Starfield comes back, comes out, and it's another Redfall, and uh, 
and Microsoft is is left, you know, with them in their their baby stroller. It's like, is that their it becomes a liability out, almost? Well, I think it would beat out Rare for like the biggest like pre to post acquisition value plummet, and, and really not even for their. Well, I wouldn't even say for Rare. I think it might have been like a EA acquiring people situation where like it was, you know, came from above where they stopped putting out, you know, the top quality that they had previously done. But I mean, if Microsoft hasn't even officially bought them yet, then you can't blame the acquisition for like the quality of Redfall. It's just Bethesda living up to their own worst, uh, worst traits as they did in fallout 70 i i completely forgot about fallout 76 yeah it's like if starfield comes out and it's a bust that's like three strikes have they had another big game come out that was like really good and celebrated since fallout 76 and now redfall and then starfield on the way skyrim i think was the last one that really worked <laughs> the latest re-release they <laughs> Right, right, yeah. Uh, not counting all the, you know, the uh, uh, play Skyrim on your Keurig coffee maker. Uh, yeah. Edition. And I, I, I myself am kind of half expecting Starfield to be a disappointment. Um, it's just kind of a feeling I have. And it's partly because the, the issues with Bethesda have been known for a while. Like my understanding, they're still using a version of the Gamebryo engine for this, um, which has bugs that go back like decades. Right. And I kind of sense there seems to be something like a complacency in Bethesda that they can just keep releasing the same thing and people will keep buying it forever. Um, when, in terms of like technical ability, they're, I think they're not a great developer. Um, it's or in terms of just like putting a game together with no bugs and that is competitive in visuals and animations, especially with modern games. But that's that's not like a, a big secret. I mean, that's always yeah. been everyone's like feeling about Bethesda. Is like, of course they're like not the most, you know, they don't put out like super precision polished games but you you put up with it because kind of like rockstar they make a kind of game that is not quite like anything else and it's just as long as they keep delivering you you can put up with their foibles it's like uh you know it's it's like the main character on any kind of show about a professional it's like they're always you know tweaking and shouting at people but you know they're the best at what they do it's like oh yeah, yeah it's like you know what if one day you know he comes into the courtroom and he's just like and he doesn't have his papers in order and he, oh he, he didn't get the guy acquitted or, or the next guy and he's like making oh 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 no maybe that pill problem has finally gotten to him um and it's like uh what if i don't know maybe if bethesda they've kept all the foibles and it's just like they can't they can't find the sound Hmm. And with the large language models becoming kind of usable now, I wonder if game development around story isn't about to become an indie thing, whereas before you kind of needed a large team to voice act all this stuff and write it all and get it all visualized. And uh, but now with a lot of the machine learning stuff, it might be possible to just have an indie team make a game like Skyrim or something. And you don't need the huge giant Bethesda anymore, so it kind of disappear. Yeah, I've always wondered if if someone would try and come in and compete with Bethesda in these giant open world games. Um, the one that I've thought might do it was actually Obsidian, because they're the only ones that have made really a, a full mm -hmm. Bethesda type game when they made new vegas and they made after that outer worlds was kind of like a smaller version of that same template and now that they're owned by microsoft they presumably have more resources and i can tell you that 
they have this game they released forever, or sorry, announced forever ago called Avowed, um, which looked like a Skyrim like. Hmm. And I thought, I thought it would be nice if someone competed with Bethesda in that arena. I think that might keep them sharp and might be good for everyone. Well, so. if no one has, then. I guess the two explanations are either no one thinks that they can and they don't want to, you know, try to do the other Skyrim and then, you know, it'll yeah. look really bad if they don't succeed. Or maybe no one's just really interested in doing that. It's like they look at the model. It's like we're going to make this giant world and it's going to be full of so much stuff. And it's like I, I think they like anticipate themselves making a bethesda game you know a game that releases and it's like it's so bewilderingly huge and has so many moving parts that it's just like everything is clanging together and it's just kind of not right it's like it's like no one's competing with rockstar either in making those kinds of games because only rockstar can afford to it's like no one can spend uh, a decade making a uh, a world of that size with that's like that intricate and if they did then i they probably just expect that they'll go broke right or what if yeah. they do that's kind what, of the third option right it's like, like maybe there's just no money in it like with seamus's uh seamus's blog right like thinking man's game analysis it's like well it's cool but there's no money in it or it's like there's enough money in it for one company to do it Mm, sure uh, market saturated like, right uh, although I, I don't think market saturation works quite the way that that people think it does it's like you know if two similar kinds of games release at around the same time it's like uh, part of me feels really sorry for the people that make the horizon games because mm. it's like they've they've stepped in front of the door that's it's like a cartoon where, where like Daffy Duck is marching up to the door and then like an <laughs> elephant bursts through it and he stands up and he's all covered in bruises and he's all broken and he tries to hobble back towards the door <laughs> and then a locomotive bursts through it and knocks him down again it's like Horizon did that crap twice going up against Breath of the Wild and then Elden Ring with both of their game releases <sighs> but you know what I people can say that that hurt them but I don't know that we have any way to actually prove that it did. It's like we don't have Universe B where Hidetaka Miyazaki decided that he wanted to, you know, sell takoyaki on the street and not make more games. And, you know, Horizon Forbidden West just releases in nothing else around. And mm. maybe it performs exactly the same. It's yeah. like art, like. Surely or, or there maybe must the, have been some number. Maybe the competition was was good for it, right? Like if you don't have a huge swarm of the unwashed masses flooding into a game, altering the community and the feedback to the developers, and just the people who really wanted to play it played it, and it still made enough money to make a sequel, maybe that's better. Yeah, but I I don't know whether there really is a huge number of people who who sit down and you know they have their green eye shade on and they say to themselves well it's either it's either horizon or zelda surely there's some number of them they've got to exist yeah but it's like is it large enough at scale to affect the number of people that actually get the game because people talk about you know like mainstream games as if that's a thing and it's like it, it really isn't it's hmm. like I, I don't people think of like like there's an audience that plays overworld games or plays RPGs. And it's like, yeah, when you get into like like huge, huge numbers of people there is. But it's like it's I, I don't know that if you take every person that played Zelda Breath Ooh. of the Wild and and ask them all, it's like if if Breath of the Wild hadn't come out you you totally would have bought Horizon Zero Dawn, right? And played that, because that's the other open world game that released. And I say, no. <laughs> it's on a different platform. I, I like, it's got I'm a different feel. Yeah, it's, it's part of a different, different franchise. It's a completely different kind of game. Yeah, it's a completely different tone. 
completely different art style. Mm-hmm. I'm a Zelda fan from way back. It's like I'm just, it's just it, I I don't think games are necessarily directly comparable in that way. It's like you Although... can be as mad as you like that Pitch Perfect Two beat Mad Max Fury Road at the box office, but did Pitch Perfect Two steal audience? from Mad Max Fury Road, I kind of doubt it. And I kind of <laughs> doubt that it would have stolen box office from them if it had also been a movie about, you know, people driving cars and being angry. I mean, I always thought about... I, Horizon was an Ubisoft game, is that right? No, no, no. It's, oh, it's, it's, not. it's not that bad. Oh, okay. I had thought... I, I'm, just, I'm just taking a dig at Ross. I don't actually have anything... Like that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> no, but, I, I have a shameful confession. I actually don't mind Ubisoft games. Oh. <laughs> it, it's, I, I, I think I haven't it. played one in a while. I the last one I last Assassin's Creed I played was four, the pirate one. Yeah, and I, I personally wasn't even really interested in the ones after that. If they didn't. Well, I mean, I. I, I'm kind of the same way. I don't necess- I don't play all of them that come out because it's like, you you play one game like that and you kind of get your fill, and it's like you don't need to go back to the restaurant every week. But yeah, you know, I don't hate going there. Uh, it's just like I kind of like games where you can just kind of roam around. It's like you oh, know yeah. they make games that you can play while listening to a podcast or something. And I don't, I don't know if this sounds backhanded. I certainly don't intend it this way. Uh, I don't think the phrase, uh, it's a game where you can turn off your brain, is quite applicable. But it, it engages you in, in a way that is, it's kind of relaxing. It's like, you know, people, uh, people will, like, make fun of how, like, people ironically put like the relaxing tag on like Dark Souls games or like oh, Elden yeah. Ring, but it, here's the secret: I don't think it's ironic because I played like Dark Souls three, where I got to the point with that game where I could just roll up a new character and think I want to do this kind of build that I haven't done before, and just like I, I could just play through it almost on autopilot while I'm just like listening to a podcast or like I have a like a, a something playing on the like some YouTube show playing on the television, just like watching something. It was like to that point, because you can just roam around, especially in Elden Ring being an open world game, you just ride around on your horse, just do whatever, yeah. pick things up, take pot shots at people that you're riding by. And it's like, and it's, it's that kind of experience. Is like, that's Ubisoft's whole thing. I, uh, I haven't played many of their Far Cry games. I think I've only played two of them, actually. But uh, I got one of their Ghost Recon games, uh, Breakpoint, I think it was, and I I just like going around. Like it's the thing that people always make fun of with Ubisoft. Oh, they just fill the the map with little markers, and you just have to go around and collect all the little markers. It's like yeah, yeah. I went around the map and I collected all the little markers. I made my own map and I marked them off, and I loved it. I love collecting all the stuff. It's great. It's just a different kind of experience. I'm yeah, sorry, I, I completely derailed it. What were we saying about Ubisoft? Well, I was. Oh, I was, we were talking about Horizon. Horizon well, we talking games about, competing against yeah. each other. Yeah, um, but no, Horizon is not an Ubisoft game. Yeah, it's made by Guerrilla Games and published by Sony, I believe. Is that a Sony game? Yeah, that's right. That's a that's a console exclusive, isn't it? Yeah. Or no, it's released for. Well, they released okay. it onto PC later. Yeah, they, I think like they, a year later or something. Yes, and I think uh, I think the sequel, Forbidden West, is not is is only on PlayStation. Is only going to be on PlayStation for a while, like the first game was. But like you were saying, a lot of these games are not competing for the same market. Although I, I think maybe the Obsidian games and the Bethesda games might. Like, it. Although there are so few of them that you really could well, buy both. 
when you're talking about New Vegas, when they literally are making a Bethesda game on Bethesda's engine with their game making tools, yeah. then I can see the case for it. But they weren't releasing New Vegas against another Bethesda game. Yeah. That was competing with it. It's like, uh, uh, and even that I think illustrates kind of what I mean about how the this idea of audience overlap is really not very clean. Like maybe there's a Venn diagram, but it's a Venn diagram of like 67 different circles. Because you think about the difference in reception and fan base from Fallout 3 to Fallout New Vegas and the way people like compared and contrasted those two games as being so different when really they're about as similar as two games can be uh it, like way more similar than if you're just talking about two games that are in the same like top level genre like two open world games what's an open world game like ghost recon breakpoint and you know uh legend of zelda tears of the kingdom like those games aren't comparable it's like I think Fallout Three and New Vegas is like the case study for how games can be about as similar as you could make them uh, without without just like re-releasing the same game, and it's still just received completely differently by like two fairly divergent groups of people. And that's not even getting into how different Fallout 4 was and how differently received that was. Or even just different entries in- Johnson, uh, you're fired. Why? You know, it's not you, Bethesda's it's your other shirt. Series. It's like, like compare all the people pining for the days of, of Morrowind. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to talk about you like you weren't there, Bob Case. Uh, <laughs> and when you get into like uh, Oblivion and Skyrim, it's like, again, we talk about Bethesda making their game, their kind of game that no one else makes, but their kind of game has been so drastically different over the years that, like, the fan base is split against each other. You get into, like, Final Fantasy games, and it's like, people have, like, this idea of, like, when you say a Final Fantasy game, it's like a Final Fantasy game. People immediately get this idea of what that means in their head, but... Like, if you get someone that likes one game in the series a lot, and you get someone that likes a different game in the series a lot, and you say, oh yeah, those two games, they're like the same thing, right? It's like, they'll have their flesh torn off of each other in like 10 seconds arguing about that. Right, yeah, yeah. Final Fantasy fourteen is basically the same as Nier Automata. They're, they're both like character focused games with japanese kind of oh, yeah. theming and... <laughs> uh, yeah they're 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 games that you get and you know you you make your waifu and well in the case of one game your waifu is literally manufactured uh, so it's slightly different but yeah yeah other than that very very <laughs> It's weird to think that Automata actually is a Square Enix game. Yeah, how did that happen? Um, but what's even more amazing is that, like, they didn't, like, chop it up. Like, that's the thing that, like, you get into, like, the foibles of publishers. Like, that's what Square Enix is notorious for doing. It's like taking a game and taking, like, a, what it's planned to be and just taking some arbitrary huge chunk of it and just cutting it out it's like they did that with final fantasy 15 although there you could argue that they just had so much crap left over from being in development hell for a decade that they just had so many scraps that they could it's like reconstitute it into an entire other person like an entire other game uh, and just release all that and try and make some money off of it but then you're talking about Nier Automata. Uh, Taro Yoko, the same creator, they published D Dragon Guard 3, uh, which is technically in the same universe. And they you know that. like literally did that. They took a huge amount of the game's backstory 
and possibly a lot of content that was almost very definitely planned to be in the game and released it as like five different expansions to be played separately and that just didn't happen with near automata hmm. and i think they in fact made a a game where i think they made an expansion where the final boss is the president of square what <laughs> And he's just shout like no i'm not even joking like like i i think the actual president of square like the entire reason that near automata exists is like after near uh yoko taro who is like this mad genius that had made very very strange games and clearly had his own kind of auteur vision it's like but had never really made very good games like most of his games are terrible uh the only exception is near which just like mechanically is just like a kind of passable game but i think i think it was a deal with platinum where platinum made a deal with square and they told platinum we'll contract you to make a certain number of games for us and the first one that you make or one of them that you make you just have carte blanche to do whatever you want and i think it was the director of platinum that said we want to bring uh taro yoko out from exile making mobile shovelware and have him direct just a full-on game and thus uh near automata was born and i think it, i think it was just some contractual thing where platinum games got to just do whatever they wanted wow. and then they just let taro yoko do whatever he wanted which of course went meant that he just went completely nuts <laughs> and, and made like this uh nightmarish absurdist like uh no no not absurdist dragon's dogma is absurdist mm. near automata is existentialist there's a difference you mm. have to you can't get your 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 you see your, now you're just arguing with yourself yes yes I, i'm sorry you know th this is basically what i do all the time it's just inside my own head but yeah um i remember wondering they, why near was think, like that it seems like such an unusual game it is an unusual game. Out, i'm like i i had never yeah and if you've played near you can see it coming or if you've played i guess if you played uh, his his previous games uh he actually didn't work on dragon guard 2 but Drakengard is famous as being like it's the classic let's players game where no one would ever play it because it sucks but it's a game oh. that you have to see because it's just so strange huh. and uh there is a very very good let's play of most of Taryoko's games uh by a let's player who retired not long ago called dark id and he has done pretty much all of his games and that's you know talking about going back to what we were saying earlier about trying to discern intent or death of the author or whatever mm. uh, taro yoko is kind of amazing to me because on one hand i kind of think that maybe you can't trust a thing he says in interviews because he's clearly very like tongue-in-cheek and self-effacing and and sarcastic but he'll like my favorite thing about all of his games is they all seem to have like this crystal clear vision of like an overarching theme or idea like Drakengard is all about like an immoral world uh and near is much more sentimental it's like came from this idea of like storybook fantasy like kind of grew out of that and near automata it's just like every single part of it just fits so well in this kind of existentialist idea. It's like you could make one of those like like long YouTube videos that like just breaks it all down. But then in interviews, he says, oh, I don't think about like big ideas or themes or anything when I write my games. I usually just think of some kind of game mechanic and make fun of how it would work. Like Nier Automata <laughs> has that system. It's like it's like making fun of Dark Souls where you just die, but then you come back. And it's just like you okay so you make a game that you're robots and when you die they just like manufacture a new one <laughs> and it just has like your your memory in it sure that that's near automata it's like 
it's uh, it's insane to me it's like it's like ron swanson saying that he loves moby dick because it's a book with no symbolism or subtext it's just a book about a man that hates a whale <laughs> but it's like if herman melville was saying that <laughs> it, it's like if you had like a, a newspaper interview with herman melville where he says yeah you know I, I just really wanted to write a book that captures my hatred of cetaceans <laughs> i just want them all dead <laughs> wow i i can't believe what i'm reading yeah. so i i don't know I is it part of the performance or is it sincere you know what i i think both may be true i i think that it may be both like the this well he of course he says that one thing that's difficult about writing games for him is that he writes games while he's like stinking drunk he's like the he's like the uh existentialist christopher hitchens of of games writing uh where he just writes while he's just blasted and then i guess other people have to like clean up the mess but i think he actually does kind of take an idea of like it's like a, the penny arcade concept where you take this thing as a well yeah, it's silly how in games you do this, but in real life, it's not very real. And like, like makes a game kind of based around not satirizing that concept, but like trying to actually make that into a bigger thing. Like Drakengard, when you get right down to it, it's just like a really terrible clone of Dynasty Warriors. <laughs> but I think you kind of get into the idea of like saying, okay, you have a world like Dynasty Warriors, where the course of like world events is driven by single people that can just slaughter like thousands and thousands of regular people on a battlefield right and it's just like what kind of world would that be like what kind of people would they be yeah it, it's it, kind like, of like the dungeons and dragons they're... thing where you you've got this insane power curve and like what would it, the right. world really be like this idyllic yeah. medieval fantasy world if that was the case or or maybe well, it wouldn't and, and no, it's just like it just every country has just like three or four people in it that no one can hold accountable for anything it's like that's the idea behind the boys it's like yeah. dynasty warrior as the boys where the main character is just like a, an absolute psychopath that just lives for slaughter and i think uh i think uh near automata kind of may have come from the same place where yeah you start with that idea of like Oh yeah, you have this world where you where you die all the time, but then like, what kind of world is that? Mm. It's like you end up with this this idea of like it's it's the meaning of your existence, and like, is there any? It's like if I had to describe like the meaning of near automata, it's like what it seems like to me. It kind of uses the relationship between androids and humans as a stand-in for the relationship between uh, man and God. And it's like this, this idea of yearning for and like having an extreme anger at this kind of uh, other being or entity that you can't touch. And there's other ideas in there of like feelings that, you're, that, are, in, that are innate to you that you can never satisfied that are like unrequitable by their nature it's like of course it's like you know the main characters especially 2b is just like endlessly sexualized but like you can see that like the androids themselves like they're not fully functional they're just like plastic underneath there's like i don't think like i, I know this sounds like salacious and silly to say but i think it's intentional it's like they have this this they're clearly created with like desire that they can never requite because they're just like imperfect copies of human beings and they're just like carrying that baggage and it's mm -hmm. like in the near universe there's like several different generations of like smaller and smaller gods creating like more and more uh like despairing creatures and it's like at the very bottom are like your main characters the yorha and i think them being sexualized is part of a long tradition of yoko taro using sexuality in a way that 
kind of throws it back in the audience's face. It's like, yeah, it's like people get off on the idea of 2B wearing all this stuff, but that's because even in the context of their own game, they are objectified. It's like they're they're like expendable. They're meant for the gratification of like higher beings that don't care about them at all. In Nier, you had a character called Kaine who wears this um, outfit that is like very, very much not safe for work. It's like <laughs> something that you would only wear with someone with whom you have a very special relationship. And she just kind of walks around in it. Huh. And it turns out in New Game Plus, uh, and only in New Game Plus, you can learn that Kaine is, oh, oh gosh, I, like what are you supposed to call it? Uh, like intersexed, uh, hermaphroditic? Hmm. And it's like, and it's like, again, I think that's like throwing sexuality back in the audience's face. It's like you had these feelings about this person and now we're going to make you feel things. And it's not, it's not like in a crass and insidious way. It's only related in a sequence of events that is all about like her life and how she came to be this very, very strange person. Even going back to Drakengard, it's like all of the females in the game are like, like, monsters or just have something messed up with them it's like you're you don't have a love interest as kaim because kaim is a psychopath that doesn't care about anything except slaughter but your sister uh you find out has uh incestuous longing for you which in some ending routes causes her to commit suicide and destroy the world it, it's complicated it's a weird game One yeah of your party i wonder if any is, of this is related to him writing while drunk <laughs> well, it, I, I'm sure a lot of it is. Yeah. But again, it's like I, I think Drakengard is like a world about. I think Drakengard is a game that's about a world of immorality. It's mm. like a game yeah, the there are, the there's a lot of fiction party. about that too, right? Like, there's a ton of fantasy books about what if God was evil and and you know you had to be a bad person in order to succeed and stuff like that. Well, yeah, I mean, in Drakengard, the gods literally are like evil, like in a kind of eldritch way where you can't even understand what they're on about. It's just like they're completely indifferent to everything and they just treat the world as their plaything to torture. But mm. they, even then, that's like a higher level of regular people exist at the mercy of these like superhuman beings, like the main characters that are just like, they're, they're not morally superior to anyone, they're monsters and they control the fate of everyone and they just do what they will. Uh, but then above that, there's the even higher level where that's just the nature of the world as it exists. Like it was created by these beings that are that on an even higher level. They're just like, they're just like cosmic monsters that you can't understand. They just do whatever they want. You can't do anything about it. Right. It's at least a and fully realized fractal universe where the, it uh, is integrated all the way up. Right, especially when you get into like the the final ending of Drakengard creates the world of Nier. Like the world of Nier was the real world. It was Earth mm. until like it, it got knocked sideways when basically you took a bunch of magic stuff and you pushed it through the veil between universes and it turns out that's really, really, really bad for the world. And it like it creates this world of Nier. Hmm. And then, of course, you know, you end up later on down the line where in Nier Automata, it's like just this continuous thing. So it's not really but, that different from Mass Effect. Um, I would say, well, it, it's it's not different from Mass Effect in the way that the games got mechanically much better as you go along. <laughs> <laughs> Although I would not say that Mass Effect is as bad a game as Drakengard. It's like that, like, seriously, that's a game that you just never play. Because uh, it's it's just not worth your time to play it. Fair enough. But then by the time you get to Nier Automata, it's like the, those whole character action games uh, in that vein, like Platinum style games, like Bayonetta, that kind of thing. I, I never played those games. I only played that because it was a Taro Yoko game. And it was still like good enough for even like a, a scrub like me to keep up with it. So yeah, yeah, high points all around for that. I wonder if I wonder if Nier Automata is the ending to Mass Effect that we all deserved? Um, no, because Nier Automata, well, I would say that it wasn't because Nier Automata was actually about, like, ideas. And, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll say that about... 
Right, but it's like it it fulfills the promise of the original game of Mass Effect the original, right? Or it's about to ideas. Satisfy, to satisfy all the people that are are still uh, mad at me earlier about ranting about death of the author, I will say that Dear Automata has lots of room for me to get ideas out of it. And you know, say what you, say what you will about Mass Effect, I will say that I never really got the idea uh, that those games were about ideas in that same way now they are in the way that like sci-fi often is where you like introduce you say posit that this technology exists like how does that change the world but i i wouldn't say that like like what is mass effect as a series about oh it's about it's about hope or it's about cycles or it's about people coming together right it's right like, it's, it's about like, what if star what, trek what was a first person shooter it's maybe like i, I I I can't I, I won't say that you can't get anything about that. Although, well, that's not even a, I, I don't even think that's a great comparison because you, Star Trek. If you're talking about like the kind of Star Trek that Mass Effect originally was paying homage to, as like the Next Generation, it's like I, uh, I now I only know Star Trek from like Red Letter Media reviews. Don't tell uh, me you haven't watched Star Trek: The Rocketeer. I have. Uh, I've seen. I've. You know what? I've actually seen some of the movies. I've never seen any of the show. Wow. Uh, I've seen. I've wow. Seen, like, I've seen all of the original series movies aside from Star Trek: The Motion Picture. Hmm. Incredible! And, uh, An incredible series of revelations. Bob, have you at right. least watched Star Trek? Yes, I have. So I have to say, I haven't watched the new stuff. Like, I haven't watched Picard. I just watched the Red Letter Media reviews of it. <laughs> <laughs> All the old watched, stuff, well, then. Between the oh, two of you, you've got one one fully Star trek individual, huh? Yeah. But, but, what, but what I'm saying is, you know, you can get episodes of Star Trek that had, like, that grappled with some kind of larger theme. It's like, you know, they'll always, they'll, they'll reel in data for some kind of episode that kind of centers some idea of like, well, data's trying to understand what it means to be human. So we as the writers have to come up with an answer to that question. Uh, kind of. Sure. You gotta, you, you gotta put data on the stand. You have to have the card talk about like, like the essential dignity of sapient creatures. And it's like, you can't just make robot slaves or whatever. Because yeah. they'll complain about stuff. Take note, David Cage. Uh, <laughs> it's like, you know, and emotion, it, the importance of emotion. Yeah. And... Maybe once a Roomba is good enough to clean your floor, you don't have to like give it aspirations other than to do that. But <laughs> yeah, oh, well, it seemed kind of strange to me. But anyway, it's like I, but I never got that idea. Like again, you can put individual parts of Mass Effect up to that. You know, again, you bring in the parts everyone liked. You have, uh, you have the conflict between the Geth and the Quarians, uh, where you know they just kind of stumbled into, you know, becoming the Prometheus of a new race that looked to them for answers about their place in the world, and they were just like so uh, shocked and frightened and unready for what they'd done that they just tried to put the genie back in the bottle where the bottle is not existing and mm. it didn't work out for him. Or you have like the, you know, the Solarians or really everybody and the Solarians versus the Krogans. And it's just like, uh, yeah, you know, you're, they were, they were apparently, if we take the game at their word, they were a threat to everybody. It's like they were, they were the, uh, the, the cat that caught the mouse. And it's like, or, or however that, allegory goes where the thing that they got to get rid of their old problem was as bad as the old problem yeah it's like, what do we do about the new problem it's it's gonna take over everything everywhere and we can't do anything about it and it's like but it's then but then what do you do generations later i will say that one problem mm. that i have with that uh plot line it's just like a scratch on the paint is they try to write it in such a way as like morden is shouldering the responsibility for the genophage as if he created it but that all happened like centuries ago so mm. they try and say oh well well he tweaked it at some point to like keep it going and it's like but it's like in a very kind of bioware type thing they try to use him as the face for his whole species 
and to kind of stand in for his species' entire place in the universe. And that's always been a very Bioware thing. Like, if you go back to the first Mass Effect, it's like, if you, like, go and read all of Tali's dialogue, Tali, as a character, is basically just, like, like this is what Aquarian is like. You talk to this person not to find out more about them. You talk to them to find about their people, their, their culture, their practices, what they're like. And it's like... It's kind of um, archetypical approach. Right. And on one hand, it makes sense because if you don't know what a Quarian is, then it makes not a lot of sense to introduce a Quarian character who is like very much very un like Yeah. Unless you're going to subvert it later. It's like they did that with the Geth, basically. Where, oh, the Geth, they're these killer robots from beyond space. And it's like, then you meet them. And it's like, well, those are actually weirdos. And like, <laughs> really weird, more than the Geth. Yeah. Like, Which is then, kind of like, the, this is kind of the anime but, approach, right? It's like every anime character you meet is really into 20th century, right? Like from sci fi, right? They're all like retro nerds into 20th century technology. Cowboy Bebop comes it, to mind. Right. Although, um, I, that, sound, that sounds more like the, kind of sci-fi trope where it's like the where they name three great people from history and the third one is like a weird sci-fi name it's like yeah, sure they do that in every future sci-fi thing oh the great minds of physics uh newton einstein Felblargs. it's like it's like well, yeah, you have to establish that your your timeline has more history on discovery yeah the name dropped on musk is a great <laughs> yeah although like i think the clever way to do that was would be to credit him for the like some accomplishment that he presently has absolutely nothing to do with it's like <laughs> so, like say that uh like credit elon musk as as the guy that uh i don't you're know, gonna have a have hard time coming up with an example i think elon musk is into I, everything oh well, yeah he he kind of is in everything it's like like asbestos yeah yeah the, the guy who re who reinvented asbestos no i was saying asbestos is into everything but that works too yeah yeah but like yeah so you have those individual parts of like mass effect that are about like bigger ideas you have these bigger themes of like like the morality of war it's like the the continuity of the species like your responsibility mm -hmm. it's like as a to like address and treat deeply the the uh like the world you inherit basically and all that stuff but then like what is the actual like overarching game about it's like i can't come up with anything unless you just go to like the the biggest thing about just like it's about people coming together <laughs> hope for the future right right all well, the there's this races had hope that we would find the blueprints for their absurd space device that they built one piece at a time <laughs> the space MacGuffin. generations from the beginning of time yeah it's like well i mean i think a, a game like mass effect doesn't need a, a single a single overarching theme the thing that kind of attracts me to about it was the world and the sense of it being interconnected and feeling real yeah there there is that uh of course this is coming from the guy who made the shantification of fallout video <laughs> yeah. well you know just being in a world where you know it can be like that and i was thinking kind of the same thing when i was playing the the mafia games i played the mafia series recently and it's kind of like that where it's just like there's not really a strong overarching plot it's just kind of a it's just kind of you just like mosey along through the story and it kind of has an idea at the end but like but it really doesn't like in the first one they try and tack on an idea at the end that doesn't seem to fit at all in the second they don't even bother it's just like it's some things that happen this is Which one of the things has that the effect of making it feel very human but yeah it's like that's one of the idea. one of the things that attracted me to seamus's work was that he really was kind of 
just putting his life on the blog. He wasn't really uh, trying to sell some sort of really polished deal. It was just like, I'm a guy who's kind of autistic. And I like video games. And I like writing and I like thinking about things. And I'm pretty smart, but I'm not so smart that you can't understand what I'm saying. And uh, here's anime ideas. And oh, no, now I'm into shooters. And here's a giant article about AI. And it's like, man, it's just all over the place. But it was very human. It was a very human presentation. Yeah, mostly just uh, asking aloud the questions that you that you're naturally thinking while you're, you know, playing the game. It's just instead of just letting those slip by and then moving on to the next thing, write them down and think them through and let other people see what you come up with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was kind of, it, it felt like an organic process at, at, at a lot of times where you're just working through the questions that you have about a game in a way that may be edifying and entertaining to others. I, um, so, hmm. I have something I have to do at around 10.30. Okay. I think I might have to, to call it a podcast, if that's what we're doing. Yeah, well, thank you for being here. We didn't let you talk very much, unfortunately, but oh, maybe we'll do it again. Right. I, 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 I regret that all the talking we let you do was mostly about Mass Effect. <laughs> oh. Did you know that games have been released in the past several years? Yeah. Never have to. You'd never know it listening to this podcast, but it has happened. Oh, man. Well, before we go to close up, I like to go back over Seamus's site and uh, just kind of browse a few things, think about what it was that made uh, Seamus's work special, and ask my co hosts what was something that, if you had to nitpick, that you just kind of nitpick about Seamus himself, his work, his, you know, his, his life's uh, efforts. It was something that annoyed you? We'll start with you, Bob. What did you think? Um, I'm trying to think. I mean, I guess I, it, I'm irritated that he died. I think he should have stayed alive. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Come on. Inconsiderate. <laughs> um, I think I, I was. There was some frustration about politics at times and there is a generally a no politics rule on the blog which was a good idea um but i know that well i'm not, I'm not sure how to even describe it no i can't think of much when it comes down to it hmm I, I, yeah, if you gave me more time, I could probably think of one. Ah, Maybe well. Maybe Rocket here, and I'll think of one while he's doing it. There you go. Okay, Rocco, what do you think? Something that bugged you about... Let's nitpick Seamus for a moment. Um, you know, if... If I had to pick something that uh, annoyed me about Seamus, it would be um, his... You know what? This is not even a criticism of him. It's just kind of a disconnect I had with the site for a while was his taste in games was really nothing like mine when you get down to it. Mm. So a lot of the games he got into were just like, uh, like I cannot believe that just out of a sense of like habit of reading the site, read so many words about Borderlands. Like, <laughs> really? Yeah, you have like a, a site that people come to to read about writing. I don't. That's just me, though. It's like Borderlands. Even then, it's like even if not in the writing, it's just like not my kind of game. And it, it seems like he went through a long slate of games like that. It's like games that weren't quite my thing, and I could see where he was coming from with the analysis, but I couldn't really connect with it because it just like wasn't what I was into. Now. Wolfenstein. Of course, every now and then, had, like, yeah, like Wolfenstein. It's like, like, this is like, uh, Spider Man. Like, you know, I'll, I'll even give him Spider Man. I know he loves Spider Man, <laughs> but uh, it, you know, I'll say that 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 those games at least had a story that I could see, like picking apart in the way that he did. Not really Wolfenstein, or like. Or especially the thing about Borderlands is that yeah. his Borderlands series had so much to do with like, well, uh, this this part works because it's funny for me, 
it's like but that's like the classic thing about humor it's like it works for you or it doesn't mm. and it's like there's like it's it's really really hard to get into why something is funny or why something isn't funny to you without like firstly explaining everything about the entire context of everything that goes into a joke and then everything about like it's the science of like the, and the sociology of humor is ironically like the least entertaining thing that there is it's like you can make talking about plot very interesting i, I have yet to see someone that can make talking about humor like anything but just the most dry thing mm -hmm. it's like mm -hmm. but like even amidst that we just frequently do things that like kind of rub your hands together and say oh here we go we'll do something good again get into prey just so i can you know heckle his work later on <laughs> all right you know i did that uh did it rustle any memories there uh, bob well i thought of something actually is we were talking earlier about how he, um we thought that his work never right quite had the reach it deserved hmm that there was no money in what he was doing. But I only, I kind of wondered if he couldn't have self-promoted better. If, uh, I think there might have been a bigger market for what he was doing than he realized. And it's kind of frustrating to me that I think he's a very high quality games writer and he never quite got that recognition, wider recognition that he deserved. And I think it's kind of partly because he didn't go after it, which is his choice, of course, but. I think he could have. I think you're right that it was a choice, though, because yeah. he would frequently, he, uh, you know, for better or for worse, he seemed to place an extremely high importance on the community, but specifically oh. on the community as it was. He didn't want it to become, like I said, like the beach, mm. uh, where, you know, a beach isn't a community. It's just a bunch of people that are out there enjoying the same thing but they're not really together. And Seamus seemed to really love the idea of his community, his, uh, you know, commenters as, you know, being everyone that kind of knew each other, which necessarily means that it's going to be a small group. And he would frequently not, he would balk at doing anything that would threaten that feeling. Um, yeah. Which necessarily meant that he was very averse to do anything that would dump a whole bunch of new people onto it. And I think a lot of his worst experiences with the site were with lots of new people coming in uh, at once unexpectedly. It's like, wasn't there some kind of debacle? It's just like a whole bunch of people from like RPG Codex or something just like poured in over something he said about like um, Fallout or Elder Scrolls or something and just, just started like panning and started some kind of feud or i think one of his most infamous articles is like the most obvious joke ever about like windows it's just making extremely like obvious sarcastic jokes about windows yeah and just like getting a huge flood of people coming in explaining to him it's like you don't understand i think it was operating system i think it was linux where he was he was making all the jokes about windows but he's pretending they were problems with linux and then all right, the linux right. guys were like, like that doesn't happen like, in linux yeah, or, or t and, but he's basically talking about like, like saying, "Oh, why doesn't Linux do this extremely helpful and worthwhile thing that Windows does?" That oh, I yeah, I really appreciate and enjoy. And it's like, like <laughs> you know, I don't say that it suggests certain things about you know the demography of Linux users, but sure, I mean, I, I think he was kind of wary of that. And it's like you know when he made uh, that was one thing I won't say that the forum was like the most super valuable thing ever but one reason he didn't want to like he eventually gave into demand to make a forum but then he was always extremely reluctant to promote it mm -hmm. and he placed rules on it to prevent like timely discussion of what was currently on the front page of the blog because even then he didn't want another aspect of his site to take away from the comments section of his you know work as it was being posted yeah and it's just if if that's your idea of what your website needs to be then necessarily it's it's going to you know not ever be larger than uh a few you know a few hundred 
posts at most on each uh, given thing. And th yeah. those were like big ones. Those were like, if he posts like an open question or like the end to a major series, it's like you would get up to like a few hundred comments. Uh, it's like, it's like Jean-Jacques Rousseau laying out his idea of the perfect society and then admitting it could never be larger than Vienna. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was like a, that was Seamus idea. He had the idea of the perfect website and, and it was exactly the size that it could grow to be and not be any larger. Yeah, I can say that, I mean, it had about the best comment section of any website I can remember. And it, aside from the occasional hiccup, but it was not, you know, you hear Yeah, yeah, a, a, aside from my occasional post, yes, aside from that, it was very <laughs> good. But you hear horror stories about, like, YouTube comments, and don't ever go into the comments, but that wasn't the right. case on his site. It's true. Yeah. Yeah, it would have been nice if his work had more reach, but... Uh... Like you've been saying, there's some there's some trade offs there. Yeah. Well, guys, thanks for joining me and uh, in remembering Seamus and and his work and kind of talking about some of the things that he was really interested in. Hopefully, we'll be yeah. doing more of these episodes at some point. Uh, there's no schedule or anything, but uh, I appreciate Mr. Bob and Mr. The Rocketeer being here with me. Yeah. And uh, absolutely. If anyone in the audience of, it uh, looks like two people, would like to leave a comment on the video, uh, we'll be kind of browsing the comments and, and looking at stuff. And uh, if you are interested in James's work, it is all up on his website still. His family's maintaining it and adding a bit of content. They're currently re-uploading all of his, uh, which we didn't even talk about, all his RPG stuff. But uh, currently re-uploading a lot of the DM of the Rings, which was one of the original yeah. uh, content that kind of brought his site to life. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff on there, and uh, you should take a look at it. SeamusYoung.com. There will be links in the video description. And closing thoughts, guys? Rocketeer? Uh, closing thoughts? Um, you know, I'll say... Uh... I, I have to admit I envy you, Paul. You were Seamus' best friend, and he said so. And I always, uh, you know, I obviously like Seamus a lot, but I, but in the way that you like someone that you don't know, I liked his work, and I liked the idea of making him laugh, and I, I seem like I never really wanted to be the guy that bothered him, so I, I never got to know him better. And uh, I don't know. I just think about that from time to time. Maybe I should have just bugged him. Yeah. Well, uh, to to be fair to your experience, um, I didn't really know him much better than anyone else. He really did keep his his interaction with the public very much on his site and on his blog. And there's a lot of stuff that he would write in articles that he hadn't talked to me about beforehand or anything. So. Um, right. He may have been his best friend, but I think his best friend is an individual, but I think really the, the 20 side community was his best friend. Oh. Any thoughts, Bob? Yeah. Closing ideas? Yeah, I kind of had somewhat similar in that even though I, I wrote for the blog for a while um, and was friendly with Seamus, we got along fine, we didn't actually talk that much, say, over email or anything. It was all, it was kind of a lot, all business in a way. And I sometimes wish that I, I, I kind of, and that's not surprising because he's a private person. I, I kind of am too, but I sometimes wish I'd opened up more when I had the chance to, or gotten more into conversations with him. Hmm. Yeah, it was the same way when I was posting to the site. I, of course, I corresponded with him over email, but it was all just like, uh, can your site do this? How do I do this? It's like this, I'll change this. And it was just like workman like. Yeah. But that's, you know what? That's probably the attitude that somehow allowed him to maintain a functional blog that was capable of supporting his family well into the, uh, you know, 2020s. Uh, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. what in the world? He's an amazing He's guy. Like, he, he lived yeah. to see the dawn of blogs 
actually coming back. They're just called Substacks now. <laughs> yeah. And IRC and chat rooms have come back, and they're called Discord. So yeah. What's happening? Oh. All right. Well, this is Seamus Young Memories signing off. All right. Thank you.